Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thank you for joining us. In this video, we are going to discuss the LibGuarded library, which manages access to shared data in a multi-threaded program. Multi-threading, LibGuarded library. We are going to show some examples and talk about why multi-threading is complicated. Then Ansel will introduce the LibGuarded library, which provides a better way to protect shared data. Multi-threaded programming can be challenging because it often relies on assumptions or an agreed-upon design which may not be explicitly documented in your code. It can also be confusing because of terminology which not everyone agrees upon or may not understand. Even a fundamental term like lock can have different meanings, so it's very important to be sure that everyone on the team is using the appropriate meaning as related to multi-threading. Here is an issue with mutexes and locks. There are three mutexes, and the names are arbitrary. Everyone working on this code will have to agree on what the names mean and what they do. Something as low level as a mutex should not actually be visible in your code. We really need a higher level abstraction to handle what the mutex and the locks are doing. So here's an analogy to show what a mutex really represents in concrete terms. Imagine a phone booth, and suppose that we need to ensure that only one person can use the phone at a certain time. We can set a rule that says in order to use the phone, you must have your hand on the door handle. And since there's only room on the door handle for one person's hand, we can be guaranteed that only one person can use the phone. When the person currently using the phone is finished, they will let go of the door handle, and there will be room for another person to put their hand on the door handle and thus use the phone. In this example, each thread is a person, and the door handle is a mutex. Note that the handle has absolutely nothing to do with the actual resource we are trying to protect, which is the phone. Here is an example of code, which is using a low-level feature, in this case, a raw pointer. There is a new, but no delete, which is a memory leak, unless the caller deletes the object. A common solution is to add a comment to this code so the caller will know they are responsible for cleaning up. In C++, a better solution is to use a smart pointer. Here is an example of a class which implements a thread-safe cache. It has two data members, the cache itself, m underscore cache, and the mutex which protects that data, m underscore cache mutex. Since the map must never be accessed without holding the mutex, we should probably put a comment in this code that says you must never access m underscore cache without first locking m underscore cache mutex. Now let's look at the implementation of the lookup method. Well, the first thing we do is to lock the cache mutex with a shared lock and then access the data in the cache looking up by key. It's hard to see if there are any problems with the implementation of lookup. This code appears reasonable, but there are some issues with the implementation. The simplest issues have to do with memory management. Since this cache is using raw pointers, it's difficult to say who is responsible for deleting the object or to ensure that object lifetime is respected for its duration in the cache. But there is a more fundamental issue. The operator bracket for an STL map does the lookup and if the key is not found, it inserts a new entry with that key and a default constructed value. This is a write access to the map, and since we only acquired a read lock to the data, this is undefined behavior. We have a race condition. So let's talk about the libguarded library and how it provides a better abstraction for accessing the shared data. Guarded is the simplest class in the library. Notice the private data members here. m underscore obj is your data. The purpose of this class is to encapsulate your data along with the mutex that guards access to it. The API for the guarded class is actually somewhat similar 
to std mutex. However, when you lock a mutex, you get nothing back. The return value is void. When you lock a guarded piece of data, what you get back is a handle to the actual data that you can use to manipulate it. When you construct a guarded variable, it merely forwards all the parameters you pass to the constructor of the contained object. The lock method, as I mentioned, returns a handle. So how does it create this handle? Well, first, it locks the mutex that guards the appropriate data. Note that the name of this lock is a local in this method and is never exposed to the caller. Next, it packages this lock along with a pointer to the object in a handle. It does this by setting up a deleter for a unique pointer, which will automatically unlock the mutex when the pointer goes out of scope. The try lock method is very similar, except that if it fails to acquire the lock, it will return a null handle. This is the code that defines the deleter. A deleter is basically a callback that is used by STD unique pointer when the resource is to be released. Normally, a deleter will actually deallocate memory. In this case, we're redefining the idea of the deleter to simply unlock the mutex that guards that piece of memory. The next class in the library is Shared Guarded. The first part of the Shared Guarded class looks very similar to Guarded. We have the same type of constructor, we have a handle, and we have the same lock methods. Shared Guarded adds the ability to do a shared lock, which is the C++ terminology for a read lock on the data. Note that when you lock the data for shared access, the handle that is returned is a unique pointer to a const t. This means that the compiler can enforce that you must not modify the data using a shared lock. This slide shows our cache example re-implemented using shared guarded. Note that now we only have one data member, mcache. It is the guarded data. We don't have a mutex and a piece of data that we need to keep consistent. In the implementation of our lookup method, the first thing we do is lock the cache for shared usage and we receive a handle. We then use the handle to do the cache lookup and return the data to our caller. In the original version of this code, we access the data with operator square bracket and this was a silent error that resulted in undefined behavior due to a race condition. In this code, since the handle provides const access to the data only, there is no way to modify the data using the shared handle. To modify the data, you need a write lock. This is done by calling lock, which will return a non-const handle. The next class in the library is Ordered Guarded. Ordered Guarded is different because it does not allow the user access to a write lock. Instead, the way that the data is modified is by passing a lambda into the modify function, which will do the work. Here's the rest of the class, and it is identical to the read lock portion of Shared Guarded. The modify method simply locks the mutex and calls the provided function on the data. Here is an example of insert rewritten to use ordered guarded. We call the modify method in ordered guarded, passing a lambda that will do the work. Modify locks the mutex and calls the lambda back, passing the data. Inside the body of this lambda, we can manipulate the data in any way we like because this lambda is called with the mutex held. The benefit of this mechanism is that there are no visible mutexes or handles that the caller can hold. The last class we're going to talk about in this video is Deferred Guarded. The Deferred Guarded class is very similar to Ordered Guarded. However, in Ordered Guarded, the modifications are made immediately. In Deferred Guarded, the modification and the execution of the lambda may be deferred if the data is locked at the time the modification is requested. There are two modify methods in deferred guarded. 
Modified detach is useful if you simply want to make a change to the data. Modify async is useful if you would like your Lambda to modify the data and then return some piece of information to the caller. The modify async method returns a future. The remaining methods provided in deferred guarded are the same as for ordered guarded. But you'll note that in the private data of the class, there is some additional information needed to keep track of modifications which have been deferred. Here is the insert method that we have looked at previously, modified to use deferred guarded. The only change from the previous example is that we're using modify detach instead of modify, because in this case we don't want any information back from the lambda, and we don't care when it is executed. An interesting property of deferred guarded is the fact that since a modification can always be deferred to a later time, it is impossible for a deadlock to occur in this code. A common scenario in multi-threaded design is that you have a public API with multiple methods, here insert and insert batch, which are going to receive some data and then call an internal method to do the actual work. This internal method does not have any locking inside it, so it's noted that it must be called with the mutex held, or it would be a race condition. Using the shared guarded class allows us to represent this requirement in the signature of the internal insert method. We add a parameter to internal insert that takes a right handle to the cache. This means that both insert and insert batch must lock the cache for writing before they can call internal insert because this parameter must be supplied. This mechanism enforces that internal insert will only be called with the write lock held. Since the purpose of this cache was to provide a thread safe map, and a shared guarded map already provides this functionality, we can actually remove the class entirely and replace it with a using declaration. This technique provides the benefit that since this is nothing more than shared access to a map, a programmer who is familiar with the STL will already know which methods are available. This slide shows a comparison between the four general purpose guarded classes in LibGuarded. There are a few additional classes in LibGuarded which are intended to be used for specific use cases. We will show these remaining classes in a future video. For more information on Copper Spice, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching our video. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or leave a message on our Copper Spice form. We want to hear from you. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.